Tommy Bertoli, an author, radio show host, Bible professor at Calvary Chapel for seven years and current pastor of the Messiah's Christian Fellowship will be taking the position that the Olivet Discourse is primarily concerning the future coming of Christ and the end of the age. Steve Gregg, on my left, author, radio show host, Bible professor, lecturer, and founder of The Narrow Path, a website in which you can freely hear hundreds of lectures, will be taking the opposite position, that the Olivet Discourse, up to verse 35, is referring, referring to events that have already taken place in the past. Okay, all right, good. Well, as you can see, it's a very long chapter, and I believe I have 22 minutes to talk about it. That's, of course, less than 45 seconds per verse. That's not enough time to go through it verse by verse, so I just have to give an overview. I'll leave time. We will have time at the end for questions if there's things that should have been covered. All right, well, the debate here is about when is the fulfillment of this chapter. Now, I want to say that Tommy and I probably have no difference of opinion on the verses that follow verse 35. Because I'm pretty sure Tommy believes that that's a reference to the second coming of Christ, which is still future. And so do I. The question is, what are the first 34 verses about? Now, in order to understand that, one only really needs to read Matthew, but one needs to be also acquainted with the kind of language that Jesus used. And because he used many Jewish idioms that are familiar in the Old Testament prophets, which are not as familiar to us, it's helpful for us to acquaint ourselves with how the prophets spoke and realize that they didn't always speak the way we do. And by certain expressions, they didn't mean what we would mean if we used those expressions. And there's no reason to believe that Jesus spoke like a 21st century American, but rather like a 1st century Jew. And furthermore, we have the parallels in Mark and Luke to help us along here. From time to time, consulting the parallels in Mark 13 and Luke 21 will be helpful in understanding what this is about. So I'm glad you all have a copy of the New King James available. Uh, you may want to keep your finger in Matthew 24 and put another finger in Luke 13, and if you're not a, an amputee, uh, you'll have another finger left for Luke 21. And if you are an amputee, I don't mean any offense by that, but uh, you have to have at least three fingers to do what I just suggested. Now, my view is that the first 34 verses of Matthew 24 are talking about a crisis that Jesus predicted in the opening verses, the disciples asked him about that, and he answered their question, of all things. And when he did so, he was answering the question, when will the temple be destroyed? You see, at the very beginning of the chapter, he's walking out of the temple. Someone points out the stones of the temple to him, and Jesus says, uh, do you see all these things? Not one stone of these will be left standing on another, but it will be thrown down. Now, in case you're not aware of the history, that did happen. That happened as part of the overthrow of Jerusalem by the Romans. The general Titus, leading the Roman armies in 70 AD, after besieging the city of Jerusalem for some time, actually breached the walls, slaughtered many, many Jews, and carried many into captivity, and destroyed the city, knocked down the walls, destroyed the temple, every last stone torn down. So what Jesus predicted actually came true. In fact, in this prophecy, we have one of the most remarkable fulfillments of prophecy in the Bible, and I would think that all Christians would rejoice in it, because it's one of the few prophecies that not only tells us what will happen, but tells it when will happen, because the disciples asked, well, when will this happen? They asked him a question in verse 3, when will these things be? Now, they said these things. What are these things? Well, he had mentioned one thing, the destruction of the temple. He had mentioned nothing else. So when he destroyed, he said the temple will be destroyed. And they said, when will these things be? You expect him to answer something that's consistent with what we know to be true. It happened in 70 AD. That's when these things happened that he predicted. He predicted nothing else. They also asked a second question. And it's worded differently in Matthew than it is in Mark and Luke in the two parallels. Now, when we look at the different parallels, realize we're talking about the same discourse of Jesus. The statements of Jesus were a certain way. The Gospel writers recorded them each in their own way. 
In some cases, they paraphrased because they were afraid that the words Jesus used or the disciples used would not be understood to the Gentile readership that they had, and therefore they, uh, they paraphrased to make things clearly. For example, in Mark 13 and in Luke 21, which are the parallels, the disciples asked two questions. The first one is, when shall these things be? When will the temple be destroyed? That's the same in Matthew 24, 3 also. But then, in Mark and Luke, they ask a second question. And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? You see, both questions are about the same thing. These things. When will these things be? What sign will there be that these things are about to happen? They're asking two things. What's the time frame for the fulfillment of Jesus' prediction? And will there be any kind of a portent, any kind of a signal to let them know that this time is upon them? But realize that if you had Mark and Luke, you'd see no reference to anything except the destruction of the temple. Because Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, they said, well, when will it be? What sign will there be that's about to happen? And then Jesus gives his answer, which is the Olivet Discourse. That being so, we would expect his answer to give a true answer. He would say, well, this is going to happen, you know, by, uh, you know, within a certain time frame, because that's what they ask, and you'll have this certain signal given to know that it's near. That's what they ask. That is what he answered, as a matter of fact. But in Matthew, it's a little more confusing, because the second question of the disciples is found in a, a more expanded form in Matthew 24, 3. Instead of the second question being, what sign shall there be that these things are about to take place? Matthew has it, what sign, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, obviously, Jesus' second coming was not in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. And so many Christians reading this passage say, okay, Jesus is going to answer two questions. He's going to answer when the temple would be destroyed, and he's going to give an answer about his second coming, too, because they asked two questions. But this is where knowing the Jewish idiom is helpful. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets always spoke of God coming when there was a judgment to come on Babylon, Edom, the Philistines, Moab, any nation that God was judging, the prophets were prone to say, the Lord is coming, the Lord is visiting, the Lord is, you know, uh, going to come and, and destroy these people. And it's more likely than not that the disciples were simply using this, your coming, to mean this judgment on Jerusalem you just predicted. Now, we might say, no, but we think of it more like the second coming, but would they? Did the disciples at this time have a concept of the second coming? Did they know there was going to be a first leaving and then coming? I don't think they did. After Jesus rose from the dead, they said to him, as, as Tommy quoted last time we debated in, in Acts 1-6, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't think he was going anywhere. He surprised them and went up into the heavens and the angels then said, this same Jesus will come again as you saw him go. Until that time, I don't think the disciples knew there'd be a second coming because they didn't know there was going to be an absence. So when they said, what will be the sign of your coming at this earlier point? It's not likely that they had this developed eschatology of the second coming of Jesus that we have because they lived before his departure and didn't even have the concept of the second coming yet. More likely they were using the term the way the Jews used those terms. The coming of God was not speaking of a literal coming of God to earth. It was talking about God bringing a judgment sovereignly upon a people under judgment. And because God's sovereignty was seen in it, although it was carried out by armies of earthly, of earthly nations, the, the prophets continually spoke of it as the Lord coming. And that is probably what the disciples thought. They recognized if the temple is being destroyed and these, this, this is the system that's about ready to crucify you, this must be your judgment on them. When are you going to come and do this? And the end of the age. The end of what age? Now, the King James says the end of the world, but in the Greek it's aeon, age. The Jewish age, the age of the law, the age of the Mosaic Sinaitic Covenant, that came to an end when the temple was destroyed. For us, for the Christians, it came to an end earlier, when Jesus died and rose again. For the world and for the history of the Jews, it came to an end in 70 AD, because the sacrifices came to an end, the temple was destroyed, and has never been built since. So, I personally think that when... I think Matthew actually records the question the way the disciples really asked it in their Jewish idiom. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Mark 
and Luke, who are both writing to Gentiles, clarify that. They remove the Jewish idiom and they just state what he was saying. What, will, what sign will there be that these things are going to happen? The same things that he had predicted, the fall of Jerusalem. In other words, there's not necessarily a question here about the second coming at all, but only about when the destruction of Jerusalem would be. Now, there's two questions. I'd like to suggest that Jesus answered both of them. The first question was, when will these things be? Well, they actually occurred, we know from history, in 70 AD. And Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. They said, when shall these things be? He said, these things will take place before this generation passes away. To the Jew, a generation was considered to be about 40 years. Jesus uttered this prophecy in 30 AD. It was fulfilled in 70 AD. He hit it right on the bullseye. This is, that's why I said it's one of the most remarkable fulfilled prophecies in Scripture, because while there are many fulfilled prophecies in Scripture, it's one of the few that targets a date of fulfillment decades before it happens, and it happens at the very time that it's predicted. And this is wonderful. For some reason, Christians often don't want it to be a fulfilled prophecy. They want it to be about something else. You know, Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist uh, philosopher, one of the criticisms he had of Christianity, which he, in his lecture he gave called Why I'm Not a Christian, one was he said because Jesus missed his prediction. Because Jesus thought he was going to come back in that generation, and he didn't. And many non-Christians have taken a futurist view of this passage and said, oops, Jesus couldn't be the Son of God because he prophesied wrongly. And it's so sad because they should never have taken a futurist view of this. There's nothing in the passage to suggest this is going to be fulfilled at the end of the world. Jesus said the temple would be destroyed. They said, when will it be? He said, this generation won't pass before it happens. And it did. It's wonderful. The other question they had is, what sign shall there be that these things are about to take place? His answer in Matthew 24, 15 is as follows. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and so forth. This is the signal. It's about to take place. Flee to the mountains. The, de the destruction of Jerusalem is upon you when you see this thing, the abomination of desolation. Now, for many years, I was a dispensationalist teacher, and as a dispensationalist, I taught that the abomination of desolation is a future time when a future Antichrist is going to put an image of himself in a future Jewish temple. And that will be the abomination of desolation. That arose from my interpretation of Daniel 9, uh, which I no longer hold the same interpretation of Daniel 9 as I used to, but uh, Daniel 9 mentions the abomination of desolation. And Jesus said, when you see that, know that the destruction of Jerusalem is near. Now, in Mark's parallel, he also has this signal the same way, when you see the abomination of desolation. But in Luke 21... Luke, who is writing to a Gentile man and does not assume that this man is going to understand what that, that Hebraism is, abomination of desolation, in the very same spot in the, in the discourse, Luke paraphrases this prediction. It's in Luke 21 and verse 20. In Luke 21, 20, and if you want to follow Luke 21 verse by verse along with Matthew 24, you'll find this is the parallel statement. This is the exact same point in the discourse. Instead of saying, when you see the abomination of desolation, Luke has Jesus saying, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. When Jerusalem is surrounded by pagan armies, that's an abomination. And it'll bring about the desolation. The desolation is near. The question is, what sign will there be that this is about to take place? Well, when you see the armies coming against Jerusalem, it's near. That's the sign. Then the next verse, as in Matthew's, you who are in Judea, flee to the mountains which they did. Do you know that? Eusebius, the church historian, writing in 325, said that before the Romans came and besieged Jerusalem, the Christians in the church in Jerusalem received an oracle from God, like a prophecy, telling them to flee. And they did. And according to Eusebius, not one Christian was left in the city when the siege took place. All the Christians escaped. Why? Well, Jesus said, do it. Flee to the mountains. They did flee to the mountains. They fled to Pella on the other side of the Jordan. 
Everything predicted here and commanded here happened. Now you say, what about the wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines? Well, probably in one of my other segments, I'll point out to you from historical sources, all those things happen too. When people say, well, these things didn't happen, so it couldn't have been fulfilled. How do you know they didn't happen? Have you studied the ancient history of the period? I have somewhat. You don't have to study it too much to find out the answers. Everything Jesus predicted did happen. Everything in that generation. Now, there's one little section that's seriously problematic, and that's in verses uh, uh, 30. I think it's verse 30 and following, where Jesus said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still looking at Luke. That's my problem. Turn back to Matthew here, 24. In verse 30, uh, Jesus said, then the sun, well, verse 29 and following. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, any self-respecting modern-day evangelical would say that's clearly a talk, uh, a discussion about the second coming of Christ, the sign of the Son of Man seen in the heavens, the Son of Man coming in the clouds, sending his angels to gather the elect from the four winds, the, sky, you know, the sun turns darkness, the moon turns to darkness, stars fall from the sky. Certainly these things haven't happened. This couldn't have happened in the first century A.D. No, they couldn't have happened the way we're understanding them. The question is, how did Jesus expect his disciples to understand them? Remember, Jesus wasn't speaking to us. We're listening over their shoulder as he's answering their question. In fact, if you look at the parallel in Mark 13, it specifically tells us that this discourse was given in its entirety to four men. We're told that when Jesus predicted that the temple would be destroyed, four men, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, took him aside privately and asked him, when will these things be and what sign will there be? And he said, well, when you see this and when you see that and when this happens to you, then you'll know it's near and this generation will not pass till it happens. Jesus talked to four men about things they would see that would signal to them the danger and that they should leave Jerusalem. That's, that's the way it is. Now, how would those four men understand references to the sun and the moon being darkened? Or the sun and man coming in clouds? Or angels gathering the elect from the four winds? The truth of the matter is, I don't have time to tell you right now, but I will in one of my other segments. I, I only have how many minutes? Oh, I have four minutes? I can, I can take part of this. Uh, everything Jesus said in that section has parallels, verbal parallels, in Old Testament prophecy. And in none of the parallels does it mean what we normally would take it to mean. For example, if you look in Isaiah chapter 13, or if you don't, you can just let me read it to you, but you can look at it yourself. Isaiah chapters 13 and 14 are a two-chapter long oracle against ancient Babylon. It actually says uh, later in the chapter that the, uh, that the uh, Medes and the Persians will conquer Babylon. So we know this is ancient Babylon, not some future Babylon. And in talking about the fall of Babylon, it says this in verse 10. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. What, when Babylon fell in 539 B.C., the, the sun went dark, the stars fell? In the apocalyptic way the prophets spoke, yes. That's how they spoke up many things. In Isaiah 34, the fall of Edom a country that has been extinct since two centuries before Christ came. There is no Edom today. But in Isaiah 34, the fall of Edom is said to be accompanied by the heavens being rolled up like a scroll, the stars falling like figs from a fig tree. The same imagery we see here. In Ezekiel 32, there's a prophecy about how Babylon would come and conquer Egypt. And, and in uh, Ezekiel 32, uh, you'll have to look up the verses, I don't have them at my fingertips, but it says, God says, I will put out your lights over you, I will cause the sun and the moon and the 
stars be dark over you. This is a common expression in the Jewish prophets. It meant, I'm going to put your lights out. It meant, as far as you are concerned, it's the end of the world. No, it's the end of the universe for you. It's the end of everything for you. It might, you know, the, the, the universe might as well dissolve as far as you're concerned because you're going down and you're not going to be around anymore. I'm going to put your lights out. That's, that's precisely what that imagery means. And when Jesus uses the exact same imagery with reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, it's, it's likely the disciples would have understood it the way that Jews understood those things. When Jesus talked about the Son of Man coming on the clouds, of course that sounds to us like the second man. How could it not? However, if you look at Isaiah chapter 19, you remember I said that the Old Testament frequently talks about God coming when it's really not literally coming down from the sky. It's really an army coming to destroy someone, but it's God's army. God is sending them. God is sovereignly bringing judgment through the agency of these pagans or whatever. That's the common speech of the Old Testament. Look at this passage in Isaiah 19, which is talking about how the Assyrians would conquer Egypt. Isaiah, if you read the whole chapter, it's talking about the conquest of Egypt by the Assyrians, a nation that's no longer in existence. But at the beginning it says, in verse 19, 1, The burden against Egypt, Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come to Egypt. The Lord coming on a cloud. Literally? Did Jesus come on a cloud to Egypt when Egypt fell? No. Did Yahweh come down on a cloud? No. Well, what's this talking about? It's the poetic language of the prophets. It's as if God is riding at the head of the armies because they are his armies bringing his judgment. But notice the language, the Lord rides on a cloud and comes. Now, if Jesus said, and you'll see the Son of Man coming on a cloud, how would that be different in meaning than when Isaiah uses the exact same expression? Remember, the disciples didn't know Jesus was going away, so they would not likely have understood it to mean his coming back from the sky, nor would they need to. They already had a vocabulary from the prophets that would make sense of that differently than we do. We're un- the prophets are the most unfamiliar writings to Christians of the whole Bible. If there's any part of the Bible you haven't read, it's probably the prophets. Christians are, find them difficult. Why? Because they use Hebrew idioms that we don't use. But once you acquaint yourself with the prophets and saturate yourself in their idioms, suddenly you find that Jesus was an Old Testament prophet too, only bringing in the New Testament. And, and he used Hebrew idioms too. More later. Thank you. Matthew's answering three questions. Matthew 24, verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? That's the first question. And, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Those are the second and third. I take the second and third question to mean the same thing. There's a law called Granville, Granville's Sharp Rule, which when two substantive nouns are put together by the word chi, they could be talking about the same thing. I take the position, really doesn't matter whether it's two questions, three questions. I'm saying the second and the third question are answering the same thing. Matthew is answering the sign of his coming as far as the sign of Jesus is coming as well as the end of the age. Luke is answering all three questions. He's going to answer the first question in Luke 21, verse 20 through 24. He's the only one that's going to use that kind of language describing the destruction of the temple. Mark in 13, he's answering the second and third question. And so, we're going to look at language that has a biblical precedent. There's no guesswork to what we're looking at in Matthew 24. The end of the age is no guesswork. The abomination of desolation is no guesswork. All we have to do is work our way back to Daniel, follow a trail that takes us into the book of Revelation, and we know what the abomination of desolation is. It is not the destruction of the temple or Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's emphasizing an individual who's setting up some kind of of some sacrificial system in the most holy place. And we're going to look at scriptures as we look at five scriptures that help us with the abomination of desolation. The reason why this is important, because there is no guesswork. The end of the age, what is the expression saying? Matthew uses it four or five times. Jesus is just picking up on what Daniel said about the end of the age. I believe the last verses in the book of Daniel, it's actually the end of days, but it's synonymous with the end of age. And all Jesus is doing is using familiar language 
that the Jews would be familiar with as far as the end of the, the age of the Jews, which will take us to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now again, Steve and partial prejudice, and we'll address this, but their, their expression or their definition of the end of the age is the Jewish age ending in 70 AD. Now, the one thing I want to emphasize here, there's no biblical precedent for that kind of definition on the end of the age. But as far as what we have in the book of Matthew, go with me to chapter 13, because this is important, because he's going to talk about the end of the age all the way up to verse 14. Actually, he's going to answer that question all the way through. Chapter 13. <clears throat> Let's pick it up and the tears explain. He says, Then he left the crowds. I'm in 1336. Excuse me. <clears throat> then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tears of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tears are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now take notice. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Take notice of angels. Matthew's going to use the term angelos 18 times in the book of Matthew. Every time he's talking about celestial beings. That's important because when we talk about the second coming of Christ in 2431 going back to Matthew, the angels are coming back with him. That's consistent with the second coming of Christ. There is no guesswork. I can show you five scriptures clearly that the angels are coming back with Christ. This parable is talking about the angels coming back with Jesus Christ at the end of this present kingdom age. There is no guesswork. He's going to define what the end of the age is. And believe me, it's not going to be short-circuited in 70 A.D. It's going to accumulate with the second coming of Christ. Let me just keep reading. He says, And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. In a straightforward language. So just as the tears are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be with the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather. This is straightforward language. Just let me un want you to understand this. This is straightforward language. The Son of Man is going to send his angels at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, speaking about the millennial kingdom coming into effect. He who has ears, let him hear. Go down to the dragnet, verse 47, the parable of the dragnet. You know what the purpose of this parable is to show us how this present kingdom age is going to end. Again, the present kingdom age is the period of time from the first coming of Christ to the second coming. Jesus is introducing this Jewish audience to a period of time that was never attested to. It was alluded to, but it was never really spoken of fully in the Old Testament. Now what he's doing in these Matthew accounts, he's introducing the disciples to the characteristics of this present kingdom age. This parable shows how this present kingdom is going to end with his second coming. And of course, here, maybe perhaps it doesn't say here, uh, as far as categorically or dogmatically, but as you cross-reference, when you cross-reference, you realize that the end of the age is synonymous with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Even taking a quote from Steve, compare scripture with scripture before you reach any conclusions. Compare Scripture with Scripture before we reach any conclusion. We have to compare Scriptures. And believe me, if we take the time to compare Scriptures, there is absolutely no guesswork. We don't have to worry about the apocalyptic language that's being used by Jesus. It's explained in different places. And all we need to do is have the discipline, go verse by verse, or cross-reference. You'll see the whole picture. It's that clear. And so, in verse 47, it says again, The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea, and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was filled, it was, it, it, they threw it up on the beach. And they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels, take notice again, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing 
of teeth. Now, once again, very strong language. Go, go with me to Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, 20. It's the last verse of the Bible, of the book of Matthew, excuse me. <clears throat> verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Four times, same expression in Matthew 24. Are we to suggest Christ is only with us to 70 AD? That's what the partial preterists are suggesting to me. What's the plan after 70 AD? I mean, Christ is only going to guarantee this, this presence of him with the Holy Spirit in us to the end of the age, which ends in 70 AD, according to partial preterists? No. He's going to be with us to his second coming. That's why these are key words. These are key words. All Jesus is doing is using language of Daniel that's taking us to the finish line. Daniel, like many books, is a a prophetic book and the highlight of Old Testament prophecy is the Millennial Kingdom. He's taken us to the finish line just like every other major and minor prophet. And so, as we look at this, Jesus is only using language from Daniel which is taking us to the finish line. How do we know that Daniel, the end of the age in Daniel, you get a chance, look at Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's talking about the resurrection. When these events will take place, they'll take place at the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. It's no secret to New Testament believers that the resurrection takes place with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so as you compare Scripture with Scripture, you keep seeing the whole picture of what God is doing. Now, let's go back to Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew 24. You read, and what he's going to start suggesting is things that are going to characterize this present kingdom age leading up to the end of the age. He says, For nation will rise against nation. I'm in verse 7. Matthew 24, 7. And and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. Now, don't miss this. But in Luke 21, the, the parallel passage, look what Luke adds in his epistle. And there will be earthquakes, and in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors. Now listen, great signs from heaven. Many scholars, that word is semeon. It's the strongest word for a miracle. You can actually interpret attesting miracles. There's going to be attesting miracles at the end of this age. Just look at the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is consistent with what's going on here. But Luke adds the comments, there will be great signs from heaven. It's the strongest word in the Greek for a miracle. It's an attesting miracle. It's visualized. It's intended to change people's hearts or think different about something through these miracles. It is not just a sign like something that might suggest four years of war without really a miracle. You know, what took place in 70 AD. Now, As we go back to Matthew, he goes on, he says, At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise, mislead many. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. Now, listen. You can find episodes of this before 70 AD. You can find episodes like this before Hadrian sacked Jerusalem in 132-135 AD. But let me tell you something. You can find episodes like this at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the reason I can be confident that he's talking about the things that are going to characterize the events leading up to the second coming of Christ because of what he says here in verse 14. Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end... He will be saved. What is the end? He's already spelled it out for us. The end is the end of the age. Now, I know what partial preterists do to this, and we'll probably talk about this. But he's already established the word teleos. He's already told us what the end is. He's not talking about some other end, as partial preterists suggest. He's talking about the end of the age. Why? Because the next verse is going to reinforce it. Look what it says in verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world. Again, whole world, take notice. As a testimony, take notice to all nations. 
What's this verse have to do with 70 AD? These people are going to get butchered. What do they care who, where the message is being preached? But it carries meaning when you realize what's going on in the book of Revelation. God is being merciful. He's showing, the, he's, he's, he's allowing the gospel, this comes out in Revelation 14, he's allowing the gospel to go out to this last generation one more time. This is making sense. But why would this verse make sense to people who are on the verge of getting slaughtered by the Roman authorities? Who cares if the gospel went out to the whole world? I'm saying, of course, it's important that we preach in every generation, but here it carries no weight to suggest that the end of the age is 70 AD. It carries no weight. It makes no sense. But it makes sense when you put it in its right context. And he says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then, now take notice, and then the end will come. The end of the age. Therefore, look at the same passage, look at verse 15, just a continuation, because we know from Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27, we know from Daniel, chapter 12, verse 11, picked up by 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, picked up by Revelation 13, we know what the abomination of desolation is. There's nothing in the scriptures that you can suggest that the abomination of desolation, or take the liberty, or you could take the liberty, but I have no biblical precedent from Luke 21, 20 through 24 that is suggesting that that language is synonymous with the abomination of desolation. I have nothing, but we do have a biblical precedent when it comes to the abomination of desolation. Go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It talks about he, a reference to the Antichrist, who's going to break this covenant at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And then all of a sudden he's going to set up the abomination of desolation on wings. If you go to Daniel 11.31, it gives us a description of Antiochus Epiphanes. If Antiochus Epiphanes serves as a type of the Antichrist, there's no guesswork to the abomination of desolation. Do you know what Antiochus Epiphanes did? He came into the most holy place and put a pig on the altar and sacrificed it to Zeus and made the Jews sacrifice a pig to Zeus. That's the abomination of desolation. It's taking us right into the most holy place. And then, of course, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which talks about the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. It says he will, he will set himself up in the temple of God. In the Greek, the word temple is naos. It's a word talking of the temple proper, which means the most holy place, the holy. There's another word for temple in the Greek, hit eron. It's talking about the temple complex. It's sometimes used of our bodies as the temple of God. Sometimes it's used at the local church. Second Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, when he describes the man of lawlessness, this man of lawlessness is the Antichrist, which is going into the Holy of Holies, according to the Greek, the Naos, and he's going to set himself up as God. In Revelation 13, we have a beautiful commentary of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. If you look at the beginning of chapter 2, it talks about the gathering of his people and the coming of Christ. One thing I didn't mention in this passage, when it says, what is the sign of your coming and what is the end of the age, the word is parousia or parousia. Probably parousia is the better pronunciation, but parousia is what you'll hear in many circles. Both, I guess, are acceptable. The word is talking about an actual present. It's not talking about, yeah, he's coming in the clouds and, you know, and then nothing's really happening. It's just an expression. This is strong language. If you look at the word parousia or parousia, look at the way it's used in a non-second coming context. It's used of Stephanus, Fortunatus. It's used of Titus. The coming. They're present. They're actually there. They're coming. There's no place the word is ever used where it's not indicating an actual present. What he's going to, what, the, what Steve and the partial predators are going to suggest, there is no coming, there is no actual coming. If you look at the language, Perusia, Matthew's the only one using it four times, and it scopes Matthew 24 and 25. The whole passage, and I'll have to probably bring in chapter 25, but chapter 25 brings, uh, supports, supports us with Matthew 24 as far as the Perusias. He says in verse 3, Matthew 24, 3, and what will be the sign of your coming? Perusia. Now go with me to 
27. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the, even to the west, so will the coming, parousia. Verse 37. For the coming of the Son of Man, parousia. Verse 39. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming, parousia. It's tying it all together. And so, what Steve and I agree with, as far as verse 35 to 41, speaking of the second coming, the word for the coming of Christ is used in Matthew 24 three times, the same word. And the strength of the word is begging us. It's an actual present. Let's go back to Matthew. I think I've got two minutes here. The Matthew... Huh? Four minutes. Four minutes? Okay. Now, <clears throat> verse 15, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation... What is the abomination of desolation? Well, once again, take the time, look at those verses that I quoted. Perhaps we'll get a chance to look at them again. I'm sure Steve will take me back there. Verse 16, Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Who is ever on the east top, on the, on the housetop must stop, must not go down to get the things out that is in his house. Who is ever in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant or pray your flight. Again, this is language. Again, we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation. The, the, the translation, my new American, adds the indefinite article. There is no indefinite article. It doesn't really hurt the text. I like to just say, for then there will be great tribulation. Again, the great tribulation that's described for us in the book of Revelation, Revelation 6 through 19. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. Again, Revelation 16, look at it. It does a commentary on this verse. Revelation 16 does a commentary on this verse. And so, verse 22, unless those days had been cut short, listen to this, no life would have been saved. Now think about this. The Greek is pasasak. Every time this expression is used, it means all life. All life. And so, only one time in 1 Corinthians is it used, and in, 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 in not so much in that way. But, come on, 99% of the time, when you see this expression that's translated no flesh, it means all flesh. No flesh would have survived. Do you know how much flesh survived? In 70 A.D., it was a destruction of the temple. It was the Jews who were being killed, not the world. It was the Jews. This doesn't make any sense if we stay consistent with the language. The Greek is reinforcing, no flesh will be saved. Look what he says. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, the sake of the elect... There is no elect in Jerusalem. They all fleed according to Steve's own words. The prophecy. They all got out of town. They all left. Then who's the elect? I know who the elect is. The generation of Jews at the end of the age when Christ comes back that's picked up in Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14. That's who the elect is. You're going to have to do some real jamming in, into your interpretation with these words. But it's strong language. No elect would have survived if God didn't cut short these days. And believe me, if you look at the tribulation, it was pretty strong. Then he goes on and he continues. Verse 29. Let me get to 29. This is hard. Uh-oh. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Steve wants to use Old Testament language. We're going to talk about this. I can show you this language is consistent with the second coming of Christ and with the restoration of Israel. Look at areas that talk about the sun and the moon. I can show you four places this language is talking about the restoration of the Jews in the Old Testament. So I take it literal. This is literal. This is straightforward language. If you look at the judgments in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the moon's losing its light, the sun's losing its light, a third of it, a third of that. It's consistent with Revelation. I take it literal. But if we have to take it in an apocalyptic context, it still reinforces what Jesus is saying. Judgment is coming at his second coming. He's using that language because judgment is a reality. And all he's doing in that context is reinforcing what he said. And we'll talk about 30 and 31 when I get back. Eight minutes now? Okay, thank you. Well, I think I'd like to use this time to respond to some of the things that Tommy said.
One of them uh, is that he said Steve and partial preterists claim that there's no actual coming of Christ. I'm not really sure how Tommy could say that. He has, I think, listened to some of my tapes. I heard that he listened to all my tapes on this. If he has, then he wouldn't be able to say that. I believe in the second coming of Christ as much as any Christian in, in history ever has. I look forward to a resurrection of the dead at the second coming of Christ. I believe that this same Jesus whom you saw ascend to him will come again in like manner as you saw him go, as the angels said. I believe there will be a rapture of the church, a resurrection of the dead, a creation of new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem. I believe all those things. We're not talking about tonight whether there's going to be a second coming of Christ or not. We're talking about the meaning of a particular prophecy that Jesus gave. Now, if this prophecy is about the second coming of Christ, it's one of many. If it's not, then it's not one of those many. But there are others. There's no reason to deny the second coming of Christ simply because we recognize that Jesus predicted something would happen in that generation, and it did. Um, Now, the biggest problems apparently we have here are some of the terminologies. Tommy pointed out the other times in Matthew where the term the end of the age is used. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, in the parable of the dragnet, and in Jesus' great commission. He said all of these are references to the second coming of Christ. He even mentioned the angels in them, just like we have in Matthew 24. The verses I read at the end of my last presentation do talk about the angels coming and gathering the elect, and it does talk about Uh, we assume the end of the age since that was the question the disciples asked about the end of the age. My contention is that the end of the age is the end of the Jewish age. To say that it is the second coming in the parable of the wheat and the tares and in the other places and in Matthew 24 is really begging the question. The question is, is it the second coming in those passages also? It may be. I'm open to the possibility. But it's not obvious. Uh, because of the many things Jesus actually said about the turning of the old covenant era and the new covenant era, and he used language like this in many of his parables, Uh, I'm not so sure that the end of the age is the second coming of Christ in any of those four passages. Now, he said, well, Jesus has only promised to stay with us until 70 AD because I'll be with you until the end of the age. And after that, he's not going to be with us. No one said he wouldn't be with us after that. Jesus is telling them to anticipate the end of the age that they have been raised in and all their ancestors have been raised in, and he will not leave them destitute through that time of crisis. He's not saying, but after that I will. That's that's reading more into it than than he actually ever says. Um, Tommy said that this business about the gospel will be preached to all nations, and then the end shall come, and he said, why should they care where the gospel is preached? They're all going to be slaughtered. And this makes me wonder, well, who does Tommy think is being addressed in this discourse? The disciples are not all going to be slaughtered, and they would be very concerned about where they're going to preach the gospel. He's talking to four disciples. He tells them that their mission is to be witnesses to all nations, and that the gospel will be preached to all nations before the end comes. The the disciples may indeed be slaughtered, but not in 70 AD. They were killed in various places as martyrs. But I don't understand why uh, one could say about this statement of Jesus, why would they care where the gospel could be preached? They're all going to be slaughtered. But this kind of brings up, when I was a dispensationalist, I used to think this chapter was directed toward the Jews. And if that may be how Tommy's thinking, then he's thinking, why would the Jews care? But see, that's, when we study the scripture, we need to ask ourselves, who is being spoken to? The Jews are not being spoken to. The disciples, some of the disciples, are being spoken to. They asked a question about a direct prophecy Jesus gave. He gave them a direct answer. Tommy says, very straightforward. I agree. It couldn't be more straightforward. They asked, when will it be? He gave them a straight answer. This generation won't pass before it does. What sign will there be? He said, when you see the abomination of desolation. Now, Tommy said there's lots of passages about the abomination of desolation. No, there aren't. It's mentioned three times in Daniel. Once, in Daniel chapter 11, it is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes. So it's not talking about what Jesus is predicting because Antiochus Epiphanes was 168 years before Christ. So clearly Jesus wasn't predicting something that happened 168 years before he was born. But there's another abomination of desolation coming after the time of Christ that he spoke of. And Luke tells us by his parallel, that is when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Now, Tommy said, no, Matthew and Mark are talking about the uh, end of the world in that passage, and Luke in that passage is talking about the end of Jerusalem. And I think, wait a minute, how are we thinking about the Bible here? Are we thinking that Jesus gave two different discourses or something? I don't think so. 
the context of these discourses is the same in all three Gospels. It's not a question of what Matthew and Mark are saying and what Luke says. It's a question of what did Jesus say? And how did Matthew and Mark and Luke understand the statement of Jesus? Jesus didn't say to Mark and Luke, let me tell you about the end of the world. And he said over to Luke, I mean Matthew and Mark, and said to Luke, let me tell you about the fall of Jerusalem. He gave the one discourse which Matthew and Mark record him saying at this point in the discourse, when you see the abomination of desolation. At the same point in the discourse, Luke takes the same statement and paraphrases it. When you see Jerusalem surrounded eyes. These aren't two different discourses, two different statements of Jesus on two different subjects, as Tommy suggested. This is one discourse. Jesus said one thing. The Gospels record it a little differently from each other, but they all had the same idea. They, they didn't, if they disagreed with each other, we have to throw out some of their testimony. I believe all the Gospels are inspired and reliable. So I have to accept what they said about this. There is no mention of an abomination of desolation in 2 Thessalonians 2, nor in Revelation 13. Tommy weighed those passages very heavily, say, no, the abomination of desolation is something that happens at the end. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13. Well, you read those chapters, see if there's any abomination of desolation mentioned there. No, there is not. Tommy believes, I think, that an Antichrist will put an image of himself in the temple in Jerusalem when it is rebuilt. Well, there's no mention in the Bible of the temple in Jerusalem ever being rebuilt. But if it is, there's no mention of an Antichrist putting an image of himself in it. It's true that the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 is said to himself sit in the temple of God. That's not the same thing as put an image of himself. It says he will sit in the temple of God. If Paul thought there'd be an image of him there, why didn't Paul say so? In Revelation 13, the beast is worshipped by the second beast making an image of the first beast and requiring all people to worship the image. But there's no mention of that image ever being in Jerusalem, in a temple, or any particular geographical area. And that's not the same thing as the man of sin sitting in the temple. Here's an image of the beast that people have to worship. It's not stated ever to be in the temple. This is taking statements that actually don't say the same thing at all and acting like they do. If it is an image of the beast that is put in the temple, then Paul is not correct when he says that the man of sin himself will sit in the temple. And there's no place in the Bible as Tommy likes to say, there's no place in the Bible that ever says that an image of the Antichrist will ever sit in a temple, in a re, in rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. So I just take exception to all these points. I only have a, couple, a minute or so left. Um, I look forward to, to making some more. I know you have questions about a lot of the things in here. You say, well, how could that have happened? Believe me, I'm a conservative evangelical. I believe every word in, in Scripture is inspired. But I believe in interpreting Scripture by Scripture. And I believe you have to ask, who was this spoken to? How were they expected to understand it? And that's what we're trying to do here. Thank you. He doesn't spell it out, but we're, it's begging us to see the consistency of what Daniel said about the abomination of desolation. Scripture interprets Scripture. You cross-reference. You get the whole picture. If we're going to depend on one verse here and there and not put them together, we'll never see the picture of God's kingdom program. This is totally consistent with what Daniel has given us in his word. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at the way he introduces this chapter. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming. It's in noun form. When it's in noun form, it's parousia or parousia. It's talking about the actual coming of Jesus Christ, picking up where Matthew left off. And then he talks about the man of lawlessness. And he talks about the second coming of Christ, who will come in the brightness of his glory. It's the consistency of what Matthew was talking about in 24, 29 through 31. It's there. I, I can't miss it. I'm not making this up. But it's just the discipline of putting all the scriptures together. As far as the Jewish age, I'm sorry, Steve, there is absolutely nothing in the scriptures that say that the Jews came to an end in 70 AD. Look at all the major and minor prophets like our last debate. Go to the many that talk about the restoration of Israel all over the major and minor prophets. Because the time I can't read them, I can read you a hundred. And the language is straightforward to suggest that the Jewish age came to an end because the, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. It should have came to an end with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ when the Mosaic law came to an end, if we're going to make an argument that the Jewish law, age didn't come to an end. 
Trace their history. They ended up in Yamna. Why do you think Hadrian, the emperor, in 135 had to sack Jerusalem and stop the rebellion? These people didn't go away. The Jewish age was still existing and it's going to exist to the second coming of Jesus Christ because of the consistency of Scripture. Now, once again, this is coming down to a principle of interpretation. Does Scripture interpret Scripture? Do we get the full picture of one verse, or do we have to cross-reference to get the full picture of what God is trying to say? This is the way we've always interpreted Scripture. This is why you have the leading Bible scholars in America as dispensationalists, because they're playing right by the rules. They're interpreting Scripture and letting Scripture interpret itself. There is no guesswork. Now look at this in Luke chapter... Luke, let's go to Luke 21. Go to with me to Luke 21. He's the only one answering the first question because this language from Luke 21, 20 to 24, trust me, it's not going to be found. Let me say it this way. Verse 20 and 24 is nowhere to be found in the Matthew account. Luke is doing something. They're all right, writing thematic, thematically or topical. All three of them. There's no, there's no chronological order to Luke. I can show you passages. He's mingling verses all over. But let me say this. Verse 20 and 24 are not found in Matthew, and they're not found in Mark. Why? Because Mark and Matthew are answering the second and third question. And so he says in verse 20, but when you see, let me back it up to a little bit. He talks about issues that remind us of what Matthew is saying prior to that. Luke says something very interesting after verse 11, where he says, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues, famines, terrors, and great signs from heaven. But look what he says, but before all these things, then he talks about the many things that are going to lead up to the scene of worldwide conflict, nation against nation. All these things are going to characterize. Then he uses an interesting thing, and it, it could be a continuative, but the word de in verse 20, but, is for the most part an adversative. He's changing the subject matter. He's talking about the things leading up to the second coming of Christ, but now he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, Then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea. And again, this language reminds us of what Matthew said. But once again, we don't know why Luke is mingling things. Luke 17 speaking about the second coming of Christ. And he's using language that I can show that is the same language he's using in Matthew 24. Now, woe to those, verse 23, who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. For there will be great stress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until certain, there's a, there's a guidepost word, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, now he picks up the second coming. And again, he could be taking us to the end of the time of the Gentiles. That's why he's picking it up in verse 25. There will be signs in he- sun, there will be signs in sun, and moon and stars. Once again, Simeon, an attesting miracle. And on earth, dismayed among the nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. You've got to love this language, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Go to Jeremiah 31, 31 through 35. It's talking about the fulfillment of the new covenant in relationship to Israel. He's pick, Jesus is picking up on the language because he understands the implications of what is going on here. He understands the implication. So he's using language that would remind him of the end days. Now, look at the difference. Look at the change of of personality to what Luke is saying from verse 25. Men falling from fear and expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. Keep that thought. The world is oikomene. He's going to say the tribes of the earth are not speaking of all the people of the earth. He's going to say they're speaking of the tribes of Israel. Let me tell you, the term tribes, when it's modified by the 12 tribes of Israel, or when it's modified by the sons of Israel, or by Israel, it's always referring to the Jews, the 12 tribes. Here, the the tribes of the earth, an expression picked up in the book of Revelation, never used of the 12 tribes of Israel. He's talking about all the, the tribes of the earth as far as Matthew 24. And then he says, For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Now take notice, but when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads. Listen, because 
Your redemption is drawing near. There was no redemption in 70 AD. They were butchered, the Jews, as a judgment of God. This is not speaking of, of the Jerusalem butcher, you know, the Roman wars, of, the Jewish wars of 70 AD. This is speaking of the restoration of Israel. And so he says, your redemption draws close. Verse 21, I've got to go down to verse 30, 31. So you also, same, same story, you know, I mean, same passage, when you see these things happening, you've got to love it. Recognize that the kingdom of God is near. What kingdom was near in 70 AD? There was nothing. Either the spiritual kingdom went into effect with Christ being resurrected and the Holy Spirit came into the hearts of new believers or we're talking about the millennial kingdom that's going to be set up, that's picked up by Revelation 20. That's why this language is totally different from what he said in in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. And one more thing. I didn't ever accuse Steve of saying, I, I even agreed with him. He takes the position, verse 35, to the end of the chapter, is talking about the second coming. I know his position, but I never said that he didn't believe in the second coming. I'm just saying Matthew 24 is included with the events of the second coming.